Good evening and welcome. Welcome everyone to the spring 2024 A. Lindsay and Olive B. O'Connor Chair Lecture. In case you do not know me, I am Professor Jody Kristen, Interim Chair of the Hartwick College School of Nursing. I also have the Women's Reproductive Health here at Hartwick. Tonight we are us four entrepreneurs who will be sharing their personal journeys to inspire you on what is possible in nursing. To begin, to begin I'd first like to recognize and thank Amy Warner from the O'Connor Foundation, Foundation for the ongoing support of these lectures. The biannual education provided for the, from these events continues to offer immeasurable benefits for our Hartwick nursing students, our faculty, and our community. I would also like to thank the School of Nursing Events Committee for putting together such a wonderful, timely program for this evening. Can you guys stand up for recognition? Thank you, guys. I also see a number of our Hartwick administrators here, so thank you for taking your time to come tonight. I'd also like to especially welcome Dr. Laurel Bongiorno, Hartwick College Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of Faculty. And certainly, I welcome Dr. James Mullen, Hartwick's Interim President. Thank you all for being here tonight. Our moderator this evening is Professor Kathleen Ash, Chairperson of the Nursing Events Committee. Professor Ash has been a dedicated and welcome part of the Hartwick Nursing Department since 2008 as clinical faculty. Kathleen's clinical background began on an orthopedic floor in Albany before she began working in Bassett Hospital in Cooperstown, where she still works as an inpatient nurse on the birthing center. We're very lucky to have this incredibly caring and experienced maternal child nurse as clinical faculty for our Hartwick nursing students. Please help me welcome Professor Kathleen Ash. Thank you, Professor Kristen, for that nice introduction. I also want to thank the O'Connor Foundation for their continued generous support of this event and it really wouldn't be possible without them. Again, thank you to the Events and Marketing Committee. Their help and dedication is unmatched, and I'm grateful. And also, our technicians tonight, John, Chris, James, and Damon, they make this event run so smoothly and take a lot of that stress off us, knowing that this is gonna go off without a hitch. So the idea of having an O'Connor Chair Symposium on Nurse Entrepreneurship was swirling around in my head for quite a while, and the Events and Marketing Committee, we, we had a goal to put together a topic that would motivate our audience, and I think we've accomplished that goal. We've assembled four entrepreneurs tonight who come to Hartwick to share their stories on being nurses and nurse entrepreneurs. And while preparing for tonight, and I was reading our panelists' bios, and I am certain they're modest in what they wrote, because what they achieved, maybe that's a nurse thing, I'm not sure if being modest, but the, it's impressive what they've done, it's remarkable, and it's a t testimony to what hard work and goals can do, and I'm really excited to introduce them to you. The format will go like this. Um, I will introduce the first panelist, they will present, and then we'll go through all four panelists, and then we'll, they'll come up on the stage and we'll have a, a Q&A time for that. So be thinking about some questions that might pop into your head as this event goes on. So I just want you to sit back and listen to their stories. You don't have to take notes. You know, there is no exam. Um, just take it in and consider some new ideas. So our first panelist is Judy Harding Salins. Judy is a seasoned professional with over 35 years of experience in the healthcare industry. Having started as a front desk receptionist at just 15 years old, she worked tirelessly to progress through the various roles and positions, gaining invaluable knowledge and expertise. Currently, Judy holds multiple influential positions, including that of a registered nurse, licensed nursing home administrator, and owner of both skilled and assisted living facilities. These achievements speak volumes about her dedication, perseverance, and commitment to providing exceptional care and support to those in need. Beyond those roles, Judy also serves as clinical director of operations for elemental management, 
where she oversees various clinical operations, ensuring the highest level of quality care is delivered to every patient. When Judy is not working, she enjoys time traveling with her husband and her four grandchildren. I give you Judy. Well, that summed it up. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. There is a lot of you. Uh, good thing I agreed to do my first public speaking to a group, a group in the medical field. Because if I pass out or straight up die up here, uh, <laughs> at least one of you will save me, right? Um, I'm not ready to go. I'm 50 and a grandmother of two, but I have a lot more that I want to do in this life. So please, if I do pass out or die, get the AAD. I am truly honored to have been asked to share my journey and hopefully inspire you to stay strong and committed in your pursuit of your career. When Maya reached out to me, I instantly said yes. Well, then I thought about it. I've never spoken to 200 people, but okay, I can do this. Maya was a huge part of my career ladder. Uh, we spent many hours studying together, and honestly, there is nothing that I would want to encourage you more to do is to get your RN degree. Ask my kids. I tell them all the time, do you want to get your RN? Do you want to get your RN? All my, all my staff, you really should get your RN degree because it is, an, it is a catalyst to so many opportunities. Now, when I tell you my journey, I'm going to start out, like she said, I was 15. You know, I started out, I begged my mom for a job. We had a family-owned and operated nursing home. I begged my mom for a job at the front desk. She declined. So I did what any other 15-year-old would do. I went and asked my grandmother. <laughs> yeah. After all, she was my inspiration to want to work there. She started our facility in 1943 as a hobby. It was a hobby. So she started a nursing home, and she built that nursing home up to be so well-known. She started it in 1943 and got her nursing degree in her 60s. So I lie to everyone and I'll lie to all of you that our current facility, she built it for me because she moved all the residents into our current facility the year I was born. Now, if you knew me when I was young, you would have been like, no chance. Um, but I did go to my grandmother and she did help me. She helped me apply. She helped me set up the interview. She even tested and sharpened my typing skills because I had to take a test to be the front desk receptionist. Needless to say, I got that job. From there, I worked in every department, activities, kitchen, housekeeping, laundry, and I finally got my CNA certificate at age 16. And to date, being a CNA is probably my most respected career and a calling that stays with me forever. I've always liked to do things uh, the hard way or backwards, as my grandfather would say, my husband my biggest fan, my rock of my life. He and I, we decided to have kids really young. And so we had to work hard. We both had two jobs. And when our girls were two and three, he supported my decision and I went back to school. I got my LPN, my LPN degree, I got my RN degree. That's where Maya would come in, even major snowstorms and study for hours for those lovely tests in degrees that we didn't even know we'd work in. And then finally got my administrator's license. Working my way up to the nursing home, working my way up to the director of nursing and the administrator, and finally the owner. So that was my plan. And really, I thought that was the top of my career. To become the administrator, I had to become an RN because I couldn't tell the RNs what to do if I didn't know what to do. So I thought that was it. But my journey did not end there. Life presented an opportunity when I partnered with a pretty remarkable individual. At the time, my family decided it was time to sell our 92-bed facility. We were private, you know, standalone in a rural community. Anybody know where Waterville is? Probably not. Um, that we didn't have the support of the bigger chain, and we didn't have the scale to, to grow. And despite our, our top-notch reputation and our full census, it was time to make some changes. So we embarked on our journey to sell. And our, my plan, our plan, our family's plan, we we're all packing up, moving to Arizona because lots of career opportunities out there for our ends can do anything. So we embarked on that journey to uh, sell. 
I lived right in front of the nursing home, so no chance was I going to let somebody else run that nursing home. And I sit there and watch that. Went to a conference. I met my partner, Joe. Heard him speak to the state representatives about his facility that his grandfather had built, that he himself moved back to Oswego to run when the facility was struggling. His respect for the state, the staff, the residents of his facility, and his desire to grow and improve health care for everybody, we knew he was the one. We were selling that. That He held our values. He would take our business, and he would do fine with that. He was a true family man that loved his facility and team. My mission was set to sell to him. It did not go like that. Joe came to the facility. We went to his. We met his family. He met ours, and he said yes. Yes, he was very interested in buying our home on one condition. Anybody know what that was? I stayed. If I stayed and I became 50-50 partners with him, he was in. So that seemed really scary to me as I didn't even really know him. But I was excited about this opportunity to keep my family business, keep my, my opportunities in nursing and, and, and administration, and share the strength by being a multi-facility, locally owned facility. Well, here we are. Nine years later, and wow, have we grown. Between Joe, myself, and a few more partners, we collectively own five skilled nursings and two more on the way. Also, we moved into the assisted living field, an opportunity I didn't even know about when I was in nursing. So many opportunities that I didn't know about. Currently, we own and manage two assisted living facilities with one more on the way. This career journey was absolutely new and exciting, I will tell you, I was roped into this adventure, but I certainly do not regret it. And by roped in, I want to tell you how this went down. About four, four and a half years ago, Joe, along with another one of the partners, they call me, Avi. They say, hey, you want to buy a 200 assisted living facility in Rochester? Me. No. <laughs> no, I got a lot. No. I don't really know anything about that. He, them. Okay. Well, we scheduled a tour on such and such a date, and we'll see you there. Just, just to look at the place. Me. Okay. Oh, well. You know, I'll go, but there's no chance I'm going to venture into this, this opportunity. I'm not going to do assisted living, but I'll go check them out, and I'll support them. Well, the day comes. I drive to Rochester, two and a half hours away from my home. I pull in the driveway of the facility. My heart instantly said yes. The home needed us. The residents needed us. The staff needed us. The building, and unfortunately the care, was less than desirable. I fell in love with every resident I met. This is how they wrote me in. They knew if I saw the condition of this place, I'd never say no. I, it would become my mission to make this place proud in somewhere that that staff and those residents could call home. We bought that place. Basically lived there for a year and a half, driving back and forth from Waterville and Rochester. And there's still, there's still stuff to do there. There's still work to do. But we did turn that place around. And it's a safe and secure home that the staff and the residents are proud of. Now, at this point, we were getting pretty big. So Joe formed the Elemental Management Group, lining all of our practices up with common leadership and common practices. Not only do I run the nursing home in Waterville and own the facility in Rochester, but I'm also the director of clinical operations for the management team of Elemental. Each day I have the honor of working alongside a talented professionals dedicated to enhancing the quality of care in care facilities. My team of RNs continues to grow. Every day we get new opportunities. Most recently and truly so exciting to me is the building of our education platform. We're probably the first one to be approved by the Department of Health for a hybrid CNA training program. We have programs throughout upstate New York and have trained and certified over 200 students in less than one year. Never forgetting where I started from, which is most important to me, the relationship with my staff, the residents, and the family will always be embedded in everything I do and every partnership I form. I thank all my staff at what is now called, it's not Harding Nursing Home anymore, it really is. It's Harding Nursing Home doing business as Waterville Residential. 
I'm still the administrator. They still maintain my grandmother's vision in our current growth and development. Continues to amaze me not only for myself, but my parents and all the facilities that we work with. We have strived to bring that, that exceptional care and that family feeling to all of our facilities. My parents, they keep real close eye on everything we do. They watch our Facebook, not only what's going on in the facilities that I directly own, but also those that I'm a part of. The team allows me the opportunity to provide support and guidance in all my adventures. Each facility has become family to each other, and we welcome new members as we grow. So I feel like I personally have embraced, which I think is your theme here, Dr. Seuss's quote, you have brains in your head, you got feet in your shoes, you can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what to do. You are the one who'll decide where to go. The opportunities are endless. I wish you all the health, happiness, and success in your adventures. I thank you for asking me to come here. I hope my story inspires you, if not mine, my grandmother's, Joe's, my partner's, because it is endless what you guys have opportunity to do. So hang in there. I know it's tough. I know it's tough. I, I cried a lot of nights, but <laughs> I wouldn't be here today and I wouldn't get to do the really awesome things that I get to do with my family. You know, you, with that RN degree, you can work as hard as you want. You can work as little as you want. I hope my grandmother retired at 86 years old. I want to be that. I want to do that. I want to be able to travel but I want to be able to work and keep, keep going in nursing. So I'm proud of all of you. And I didn't pass out, so that's a pretty cool thing. So thank you so much. Wow. You do a lot. Yeah, we're a busy lady, business person. All right, I have our second panelist. I, I'm going to introduce to you. This is Susan Carlio, and Susan has been a nurse for over 40 years. Her education includes St. Vincent's Hospital School of Nursing in New York City, Mount St. Vincent College, and Long Island University. Susan's areas of nursing expertise include medical surgical, emergency department, obstetrics, and post-anesthesia care. She worked as the assistant nurse manager on the obstetrical unit at North Shore University Hospital. Susan has also worked as an emergency department nurse at Krauss Irving Hospital in Syracuse, and a post-anesthesia nurse at Upstate Surgical Center in Liverpool. All this nursing experience and education prepared her well to open Carlio Legal Nurse Consulting in Syracuse, New York. Susan has been in this role since 2007. In addition to reviewing medical records and clinical guidelines from professional organizations for medical malpractice investigations, Susan prepares and accompanies attorneys for depositions and trials. Also, since 2017, Susan has been a nurse expert claims reviewer for the New York State Office of Professional Discipline. I give you Susan. Thank you, Mrs. Ash. Okay. Figure out how to move my slide. Oh, one ahead. Okay. So yes, um, I've been a nurse a very long time, um, and having the clinical experience that I've gained, and uh, including management, including quality assurance, um, has really helped me become a legal nurse. And we're going to go into that. Um, so working all that time, in 1994, I was in the emergency department, and the defense attorney for that hospital came up to me and said, would you be interested in um, reviewing some records for me at a different hospital? And I said, yes, I would. You can't review records at the hospital you work at. So I said, absolutely. So I did. I reviewed several records for her. And then after that, I said, you know what, I really couldn't leave my job. I needed the money, I needed my benefits, I needed the insurance. So I kept working clinically. And then years later, in 2007, the opportunity arose again for me. And I said, you know what? This is what I want to do. 
I said, I've always had a detective mindset. I love reading mystery stories. I like to figure out who done it. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna look into this. So I started taking some legal nurse consulting classes. I got a business attorney, set up my office. I didn't have a desk, I didn't have a computer, I didn't have a stapler. And I got all those things that I needed. And I went to this business attorney and he helped me set up a letter of agreement, which is how you work with attorneys. We're gonna sign this paper saying, I'm gonna review this case for you and it will be due at a certain time period. And that way it sort of protects you a little bit too. So I did that. Then I wrote up a medical legal newsletter, and back then uh, stamps, I'm aging myself, but back then stamps were cheaper. And so every month I sent this newsletter out to many medical, practice, uh, medical malpractice attorneys, plaintiff and defense. And I, in it I included a little hello, uh, a medical joke, I always like to have a little humor in there, and then up-to-date medical information. So I would mail it out with my picture on it. And then I went out on foot and I researched 12 local attorneys, put together a prof professional folder with my CV, how I could help them, again, a business card and chocolate, and went to 12 attorney offices just intending to go to the desk and hand the secretary this little thing and maybe she'd pass it on. So one of the attorneys, I'm walking in and he is walking down the hall and I recognized him, but he recognized me. And he said, Susan, I've been meaning to call you. He said, can you come in a few minutes now and talk to me? I have a case I want you to review. I sat down with him and I came home with my first case that day as with my practice. I set up my website on my own and then years later I hired a company to do my website. And I joined the Organization for Legal Nurse Consultants. It's the only professional organization and it's called the American Association of legal nurse consultants. And that was probably the best thing I could have done to, to work on my practice. Because I get, got to network with new LNCs, successful LNCs, and they had all the education as well. Then in order to keep my business going and get referrals, I joined the County Bar Association. I went to their events, I went to their conferences, I went to the New York State Bar, I'm from Syracuse, I went to New York State Bar Association conferences and I exhibited. I became a sponsor for the New York Trial Academy. And I just stayed very active. In the meantime, I'm still working full time. So I would take a day off here and there and do the day trips. But a lot of times I was very lucky working in the PACU, I worked six to two. So I would get home by 2.30 and then I could actually have appointments after that as well. So I was really working two jobs or two full-time jobs at the same time, especially when I was very busy reviewing cases. But I think it was very beneficial to keep me clinically active and hitting the mic, clinically active and <laughs> keep my certifications up to date. Because I had ACLS, I had PALS, and I had my certification as a perianesthesia nurse. I wrote articles for um, newspapers in Rochester, in uh, Syracuse, in Albany, and in Buffalo, and I sent them articles on how a legal nurse can help you. Of course, with my picture again. I had a, a luncheon for attorneys. I did a PowerPoint, and I invited them all there and put the PowerPoint on and talked to them about how I could help them with their practice. And then I got asked to present at the defense bar. They flew me to New Orleans, and I did a conference on sepsis with an attorney and I got to co-author an article on sepsis with this attorney. So the many years, 25 years, I worked in the PACU, which I don't know if you know what that is, is an abbreviation for perianesthesia care unit, and I had my certification. So besides working in the background on cases, I could now be an expert for the PACU if I was working at the time of the event, the case, okay? You have to be working 50% of your time in that specialty area, if it involved a PACU case, and it did. So I, I was an expert for several PACU cases, went to depositions, went to trials, um, you know, gave my testimony. I was also, um, over the years, I've been an expert fact witness, and what that means is I review a medical record, I tell the attorney everything that happened, I know the story, soup to nuts, I know everything, and I get into, to go into trial and I give a testimony, I tell the judge and the jury what happened in the case. 
I can't give an opinion. I'm talking about the facts only, straight from the medical record, and that helps them understand what happened. The office, uh, Kathleen, uh, Ms. Ash, I'm sorry, she actually mentioned it. Um, the Office of Professional Discipline contacted me, the prosecutor's office, out of nowhere in 2017 and said, oh, we'd like you to work for us. Is that a possibility? And I said, yes. And what it is, it's um, LPNs, RNs, working in their job. God forbid something unfortunate happens, okay? It could involve patient abuse. It can involve patient neglect. It can involve narcotic abuse on the case of the nurse. And what happens is the job um, lets the Board of Nursing know that this is going on and they get reported. So now it can affect their license. So the Board of Nursing contacts the prosecutor. I'm the RN expert that gets called in. I review the situation. Sometimes I've actually seen many times video, like stealing narcotics. It's all on video. It's, unbelie it's unbelievable. It's like a movie. Um, you wouldn't believe it, really. And, um, or it might be just the medical record. But what happens is, I read this over and I tell the attorney, yes, we have documentation here that something happened. You know, it will go to a hearing. And the hearing is before the Board of Nursing, myself, the prosecuting attorney I'm working with, and a lot of times, actually I have a case coming up, the nurse brings her own defense attorney, okay? It gets very serious. So she could be suspended, she could be put on probation, she could lose her license. It's unfortunate. So, as I said earlier, I joined the American Association. I'm going to show you um, one of the slides has that on it, but what I want to tell you about it is that in 2016, this is all volunteer, by the way. Um, 2016, I became the president of the organization. Right now, I'm the legal nurse consulting ambassador. I don't know what ambassador means, but it means that you can contact me if you're interested in legal nursing, and I will help you get involved in the organization and help you learn what to do, okay? And um, right now we're having another conference. Every year we have a conference, so ours is in Pittsburgh in April and I'm the chair of the conference, of the yearly conference. So it's made me grow too in my practice, okay? So I met some really nice people tonight. The administration team, but my fellow entrepreneurs, okay? And there are, we're nurses. That's one thing we have definitely in common, and the entrepreneur spirit is something we have in common. So there are common traits that you need to have as an entrepreneur, and some of these are actually specific for nursing, okay? So I wanna go over with you some of the traits of an entrepreneur. And I might have said some of these things in my talk here, but one of the things is I always found myself very detail-oriented. You know, I'll put the period at the end of the, the sentence and what else happened and then when did that happen and I'm looking at the medical record. So you have to be, have a very analytical mind as a legal nurse, but even in entrepreneurship, you have to be a positive thinker, you have to be an independent person, okay? You have to be persistent. Um, I find for me and what I do, I have to be honest, which I am honest anyway, but especially in this field, Honest, objective, and I have a tell it like it is attitude. The attorneys I work with don't want to hear, don't sugarcoat it. They want to know exactly what happened, when it happened, and how it happened. They want to know everything, okay? So I'm the one that has to tell them that, good or bad. Sometimes nothing happened, and I have to tell them that. that was, I had to do that years ago in, in New Jersey. I was talking to the attorney for a hospital there, and something happened in their PACU, and she was the defense attorney. And she called me, it was one of the first cases I did, for PACU, and she said to me, this happened, and I had to call her back after I read the records, and I said, you know, I'm a little anxious to tell you this. I said, but I want to tell you, I have to tell you the truth. And she said, go ahead, and I told her what happened. They made major mistakes. And she said, you know what? That will never happen here again. I'm gonna to see to it that nothing like this ever happens again at our hospital. So you, you gotta tell the truth, no matter what you do. Okay, you gotta be friendly, honest, objective. Okay, um, one of the attorneys I work with said that, he put it on my website that I have a tell it like it is attitude. Um, a little sense of humor, it never hurts. Have a good sense of humor, even though some of the cases I take on, they're horrifying. I mean, they involve death, you know, it didn't have to happen. 
So, uh, but you have to have, you know, I'm not laughing about that, I'm talking about other things, just add a little levity to the situation, okay? I have to have great communication skills and be an excellent listener, okay? You have to know when to listen and when to talk. And open-minded, um, self-confidence, right? You have to stand up, be self-confident, that's not easy. We're, we weren't born with all these traits. You know, we had to acquire them over time. Maybe they were in us and we had to bring them out, but it takes work, okay? It's a, it's a daily thing, okay? And I'm a little older than a lot of the other entrepreneurs and I didn't grow up with a computer in front of me, okay? I didn't. So I had to learn computer skills, technology skills, office software. You know, I had to take classes on that or teach myself, okay? And uh, business and time management skills. Some of those things you don't learn in nursing, right? So you have to, you have to learn those things. So I'm not gonna get into what a legal nurse is. I told you how, what I, how I got there, but what, what do we actually do, okay? So L is legal, it's the law, okay? I work with legal, I work with attorneys, okay? N is a nursing professional with the medical knowledge. You will be nursing professionals and you will have that medical knowledge, okay? As you work, you're gaining clinical skills and your medical knowledge. And C is a consultant who offers advice, okay? That's what a legal nurse is. So I evaluate the medical record, I tell the attorney what happened in the record, and I correlate it with what happened, the healthcare given, and the outcome of what happened. And I put the story together, okay? It's a whodunit. So as a nurse, you're gonna continue to use your medical knowledge, your clinical skills, your experience, and the assets you have inside you in a different way, okay? I'm still a nurse, okay? I gave up clinical in 2019, I do miss it, but it, it was time, it was time for me. It had been 44 years working clinical. So uh, I look at the metal facts in the record. I go through the medical record. What happens is a family will come in, tell an attorney this happened to our loved one, and it shouldn't happen, okay? Or if a patient is alive, he will tell the story. And I look through the medical records and I read them and I relate whatever happened to the case or the claim, okay? So let's say there's an allegation of harm, I have to put that together. And when you're looking at a case, you're talking about standards of care. And for a medical malpractice case, now remember I work for plaintiff, plaintiff is the patient side, and defense is perhaps the hospital, is the hospital side or maybe the doctor's attorney, the doctor's side. Whoever's being sued or gone, you know, their allegations are against them, that's the defense. So in order to get a case and, and figure it out, there are four elements to a medical malpractice case. One, first one is duty, okay? You have to say that if a nurse did something, we're gonna use nursing for a minute. Nurse did something to harm a patient, okay? But did that nurse, was she in, in charge of the care of that patient? Yes, okay. So that was the duty. Breach of duty is did she do something against the right, the right way to do things? Did she give the wrong med? Or did she give something that the patient was allergic to? Or did she harm the patient? Whatever the allegation is, that's the breach of duty. Did that breach of duty cause damages to the patient? Okay, so those are the four elements of a medical malpractice case and they all have to be there. Can't have one, you have to have all four. You have to be able to prove it, okay? Um, so that helps determine the merits of a case, okay? Then I take the medical record, I make an outline of the, the facts of the record, I will make, a, I have chronology software, which I taught myself, and it actually organizes, I could put something in for June, and then something for December, and my, my software will organize it for me, which is a beautiful thing, okay? Okay, so, um, a lot of times back years ago, one of my, one of my first cases was 6,000 paper pages. Got delivered to my front door in a huge box, put them on my dining room table and I had to sort them all out. Now, thank goodness, um, cases come to me now on a, um, a CD, they mail it to me, or they drop box, or they uh, email. They'll even email a case to me, okay? Um, I also help attorneys put together litigation materials. So if there's actual complaint and we're starting the case, I will help him write up what the failures were involved in the case, 
Or if it comes down to um, a settlement, I will help him write up the settlement papers. I look up medical literature, and what happens with medical literature, I just want you to know this, it's important. If uh, a case happened in March 6, on March 6, 2017, okay, and the incident happened then, the healthcare provider is responsible for knowing what took place and what's in the research before 2017. If a medication is known later on, years later, like now, to cause harm to the patient, that, that doctor could never know that, okay? So you have to go back in time when you research your medical literature. And that's why the attorney needs you in order to look those things up. There are different sites you have to access, et cetera, okay? Uh, I help attorneys get expert witnesses. Like I was a PACU, <laughs> my fault. Um, I was a PACU expert on a case. I can help him get an orthopedic expert. I can help him get an anesthesia expert, okay? Because I have that, I have the networking as far as experts go, okay? I had a nurse call me yesterday, be a PACU, and I've been out of the PACU since 2019. The case was after. I, there's no way that I could take the case on. So I helped her get somebody. Okay, so I use my nursing knowledge. I do civil cases. I do know a lot of nurses that do criminal as well. Okay, so I help them with depositions. That's when you're brought in before trial. It's very official. It's all um, being recorded, and you're being asked questions if you're the person who caused, perhaps caused the harm or is being accused of it. Uh, the attorney will ask you questions, okay? This is before trial. And then they have the right to use those questions that they asked you at the trial, if the case goes to trial. So I write up the questions for the attorney. And I sit next to him in the deposition, and when the person answers a question, he wants to know, is there anything else I want to ask? So I'm writing him little notes, and he's continuing the interrogation, okay? I also uh, go to trial, and I set up exhibits for the, uh, the jury so that they can see exactly what happened. I've put together very important parts of the record, et cetera, and other um, exhibits. So we review, I review medical malpractice, plaintiff defense. I've done personal injury. Personal injury is a slip and fall or a car accident. Uh, toxic torts is uh, dangerous chemicals or uh, substances that you might be exposed to and then you have side effects from that. Uh, product liability could be a drug, could be an implant, mesh. Uh, workers comp, I've done that many times. Somebody gets injured on the job, hurts their shoulder. Um, the job doesn't really buy it that it happened on the job and then maybe they had a shoulder injury from years ago. Sends them to an orthopedic specialist and I go with the patient to the doctor's office while the exam is going on. So I'm an observer. Uh, disability cases, and as I said, criminal cases. I know a lot of nurses who do criminal, and they, they actually, I don't want to say love it, but they do enjoy doing those things. Okay, I work independent, behind the scenes. I also work, the last one is LNC work expert, and you have to be working 50% clinical of the time at the time of the event. Uh, I know a lot of nurses who work in-house in a law firm, hospital risk management, uh, that's the OPD, Office of Professional Discipline, Insurance companies, uh, patient safety organizations, quality assurance is where I got my start, and business and industry departments. So this is the organization, the American Association of Legal Nurse Consultants, and I said has networking, has education, and it's, um, it helps, uh, believe me, I know so many successful LNCs through this, and we're lifelong friends to this day. And I've presented for them uh, many times, like a presentation like this, I've gone and taught the, at the association. So I want to thank you for listening. I appreciate your time. Um, this picture here cost me a lot of money. dollars. <laughs> I went to a county bar association. I was wearing a long pair of pants and a long sleeve shirt. And I sat down and the audience said, well, what do you do? Well, what do you do? I could do. And I go, oh, it's, you know, it's a little complicated. Well, no, no, you just sit there and tell me what you do and I'm going to draw you. So I sat there and I told him what I did. And this is the picture he came up with, with the patient going, you know, the arm up, which is how it happened. And uh, $5. I have it. It's, that, it's huge, 11 by 14 in my office <laughs> and on all my marketing material. So it was worth it. Plus, I met a lot of attorneys. Okay, thank you so much.
so interesting, all the details of these two entrepreneurs' careers. My questions are, are mounting. Let's see. Okay. On to our third presenter tonight, our third panelist is Morgan Ash. And I like to say the Hartwick employees bring their best to work every day that they come to work. And I know I have today, as I introduce to you Morgan Ash, who's my lovely daughter-in-law and the mother of my grandson, Brody. <laughs> He's 20 months old. Morgan Ash is a board-certified family nurse practitioner specializing in cardiology as well as aesthetics. She began her education in healthcare at the Belanger School of Nursing in Schenectady, where she obtained her associate's degree in nursing in 2010. After that, Morgan got her master's degree in leadership and a post-master's certificate as a family nurse practitioner. Morgan specializes, her specialties as an inpatient nurse included cardiology and ICU. Morgan currently practices as a family nurse practitioner in a cardiology practice in the Capital District, caring for patients in the office setting, an urgent care setting, and also in the inpatient setting. Additionally, Morgan recently became certified in administering Botox, where she works with her patients to achieve their aesthetic goals confidently in their own home, which is interesting. I give you Morgan Ash. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. I'm Morgan, Kathy's daughter-in-law. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's my education. My education, kind of what Kathy just talked about. Um, I did actually graduate with a bachelor's from Oneonta, so this town is very familiar. Um, and then went to nursing school. It was known as Ellis School of Nursing then, um, but now I guess it's Bellinger. Um, and then got my master's in nursing leadership, which I never used, and then got my master's um, as a nurse practitioner. Um, so I did work at Ellis bedside. I did start med surge, and then I went to the ICU. I did some traveling for a little bit and moved to California. Then I came home because I met Kathy's son. Um, <laughs> And then I worked at Albany Med in the ICU and then got my FNP and I've worked in cardiology since. Um, and then as she said most recently, um, I got certified to give Botox and that's like the entrepreneur part of this. Um, so I just do that on the side. Um, so my motivation is obviously my child, um, but I have always enjoyed helping others um, and yeah, I didn't really know what nursing would consist of. I didn't really even know what an RN was when I started, and thankfully I liked it. Um, I have a lot of patient stories. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about them. Um, and yeah, working with sick patients taught me not to take my own health for granted. You know, you could be having a rough day, but then you think about the patients that you're taking care of and that you see and they can't leave the hospital, um, young people, people your age, people younger than you, and it makes you really grateful for what you have and the health that you have. Um, and then the benefits unique to nursing. So you can do anything, obviously, by the vast differences of what we do. Um, the schedule flexibility, you can work eight hours, you can work 12 hours, full-time, part-time, days, nights, um, weekend track, and different job settings. You can do the hospital, outpatient, um, legal nursing, which I, I didn't even know much about until today. <laughs> um, and then you can always, there's always opportunities to move up in your career um, and keep going to school, keep getting certified in different things. Um, you can work independently, as we all do, which is a great opportunity. Um, obviously, nursing school is very hard, and the struggle is very real. Um, but it's definitely worth it, worth every single day. Uh, it's very, very, very rewarding. And, you know, some days you want to cry but <laughs> or quit, um, but most days you don't. And 
the schooling is definitely worth it. I don't think I have, yeah, that was it for my slides. That's it, mine's quick. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. Okay, our last panelist before we go to Q&A is Christina Bosworth. Christina received her associate's degree in nursing at St. Elizabeth Hospital, um, St. Elizabeth College of Nursing in Utica in 2009, and her bachelor's at the Grand Canyon University in Arizona in 2015. She has been a registered nurse for 15 years with a wide variety of experience as an inpatient staff nurse, hospice and palliative care, and medical legal death investigation. Christina is educated in the specialties of holistic nursing and nurse coaching, of which she holds a national board certification in the field of nurse coaching. For the past five years, she's been a coach for nurses and nurse leaders who feel the deep effects of burnout in their professional and personal lives. She supports them in the creation of well living by intention integration and the awareness of internal strengths and in navigating through areas of opportunity for growth. Christina is the founder of Whole Nurse Hub, a nurse coaching consulting agency that educates nurses in all fields of, in the art and science of holistic nursing and enhances the role of the staff nurses and nurse leaders. She aims to elevate the standard of care, promote healing in its most profound form, and foster a deep connection between nurses and pa the patients they serve. Through her consulting efforts, Christina offers culture change within healthcare organizations, leading to a deeper sense of professional belonging and increased nurse retention. I give you Christina. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me here. So I've been a nurse for 15 years. Third. My mom is right here. <laughs> it's the first time talking. Um, and to understand where I got to this point, I have to take you back to when, back to when I was in your seat. When I was a student nurse. I knew I wanted to be a nurse, a nurse. But it was identifying what kind of nurse I wanted to be. I knew I loved babies. So there was the maternity rotation, and I had this beautiful little eight-pound baby. All eight hours, he couldn't be with his mother, so I just rocked him in his chair. But I didn't want to be that kind of nurse. I knew I loved the elderly population. I watched my mom for years take care of all of our elderly family members. So when I was a senior nursing student and I walked into my 99-year-old patient trying to moonwalk in his Spanko boots and I got him into bed and said, how are you doing this morning? And he looked at me and said, well, the sun is up and so is the erection you just gave me. <laughs> I knew that wasn't the moment I knew what kind of nurse I wanted to be. No, it was the 24-year-old drummer. It was my final nursing rotation, and I walked in to change a shift. And I looked at my assignment, and I recognized the name. He was a peer of one of my older sisters. And I had this like pit in my stomach because I knew him, and this was an oncology floor. So I knew he had a diagnosis of cancer. So I listened to the night nurse give the day nurse report, and let's call him Jay. Jay was end stage, and they said, the one thing you have to do is stay on top of his pain medication. He is in so much pain. I remember walking into his room, and I really don't remember all of the events of the day, but I can remember the entire day, the lights were off, his mom was so attentive, I found him laying in his bed. He opened his eyes. I introduced myself, and he immediately said, are you Sarah's sister? I was. The whole day, he joked. He had such a sense of humor. Afternoon came. 
Pain wasn't subsiding. The jokes were fewer and far between. He asked for red jello for lunch. It never came. Gotta love the cafeteria. <laughs> An hour later, we called, we requested red jello. It never came. So I'm sure I spoke really nicely about the cafeteria. And I went downstairs and bought some red jello. And I came up to his room and I put it at his bedside in this dark room where he was just resting. And he was so tense and he was in such pain. And the pain medicine wasn't due. And I said, Jay, is there anything else I can give to you right now? I brought your red jello. He said, can you just, can you just rub up here for me? So I put my hand right over his shoulder and I started massaging his shoulder and I could feel every bone beneath his thin, fragile skin. And I started rubbing his shoulder and I watched him relax. I felt the tension release. And it was in that moment that I knew immediately what sort of nurse I wanted to be. It wasn't necessarily an oncology nurse, although I did go on for 10 more years in my career as an oncology nurse. But I wanted to heal in ways that couldn't be seen. I wanted to be a part of a bigger experience for patients. So fast forward 10 years, I'm on maternity leave for my second child, and I was kind of joking, but somewhat serious, telling my husband, like, please, let me be a stay-at-home mom. I was working in the ICU at the time. I was four months in, and I absolutely hated it. It was my first experience with burnout. I felt zero connection. I didn't feel like I was in a supportive space to create the experience I wanted to. And I once had this doctor tell me while I was, like, nine months pregnant, Christina, stick to real medicine. Enough with this conversation. So two things. One, I'm really glad that I didn't become a stay-at-home mom because those little people suck the life out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and two, I'm a third-generation nurse, so at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm looking down at my daughter thinking, what are you doing? There is an opportunity for her to be a fourth-generation nurse if she wanted to. You got into this profession for a reason. So why is it that you don't want to go back? So I did what any tired mother does. I started shopping on Amazon Prime in between Google searching, what else can you do in the nursing field? I found nurse coaching. There's a few different programs out there. I couldn't quite figure out what it was, but I was like, this kind of sounds cool, holistic, kind of crunchy, whatever. We'll see what this is. I applied into programs, and I had this conversation with this woman, and it was incredible. And, and, and I don't remember what was said, except that I left the conversation feeling like she believed in me. She knew that my experience as a nurse was real. She knew what I wanted for patients in, in my life was real. And she believed that it was possible. So I'm pretty sure I called my mom and told her I just spent $3,000 on a course for nurse coaching, and she thought I was being catfished because I didn't even know how to explain it. I was really impressed that she even knew what catfishing was. <laughs> but I thought, you know what, if I spent $3,000 on this one conversation that allowed me to believe again, it was totally worth it. Because nursing is this really beautiful profession where we are both an art and a science. I needed more art. I needed to step away from the biomedical model that we know to be true in healthcare and mainstream. And I needed to create an experience, and I couldn't figure out how to do that at the bedside anymore. So nurse coaching is a recognized and board certified specialty in the nursing profession, where nurses partner with individuals and support them in developing their idea of whatever health and wellness looks like for them. And then they go and create it. We believe that holism isn't simply recognizing the mind, the body, the spirit, the environment, but that everything is interconnected and experiential. And as holistic nurses, we believe that in order to create that opportunity for others, 
We have to create it and experience it for ourselves first. Nurse coaches stand on the wellness side, rather than the sick care model that most of us experience in mainstream. Our clients come to us seeking something they knew they want, they knew that they need, but they don't know how to get it without support. Nurse coaches are the bridge. We serve a population of people who believe that they want to achieve a healthier, more well life, whether it's preventing or reversing chronic illness, decreasing stress, finding purpose in their life, or trying to accomplish maybe a triathlon with a little bit more joy in their life. We empower. But most importantly, we believe that our client's idea of health and wellness is possible for them. So I have now been working as a board-certified nurse coach for five years. I have a private practice. I was back at the bedside during COVID working in the ICU, and I saw my peers all over the nation and all the Facebook groups burnt out. So I started offering support space online. Zoom was awesome. This is a nurse them as they navigate how extensive their career burnout is pouring into their personal lives. And I support them in finding more fulfillment in life, finding more fulfillment in their career, so that they in turn feel healthier. But this isn't really where my journey ends. I have really high hopes to completely revolutionize the way nurses approach practice. I believe that holism is a larger part of care that needs to be infused into mainstream healthcare. And the way that we do that is by experiencing it ourselves. I want to bring policy change at the highest levels of government so that as you continue in your career, it gets more in line to the root of why, more aligned to the root of why we became nurses. I want to be the blend of fierce meets gentle and discomfort meets compassion. I want to speak loud enough so that every nurse feels so connected to the experience that the nursing role can provide because every nurse is connected to themselves first. Nursing school is definitely a ride of its own. There are memories to be created, there is stress to be had, there is compassion to be given, there are so many trials. There's excitement, there's fear, and it's really hard. And it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to be curious, because curiosity is the bridge that gets you from what you know to what you don't know. It's an opportunity for you to go inward and get to know yourself because the more that you consciously and intentionally invest in you academically, personally, professionally, the more likely you will be able to show up and allow others to experience the best versions of who you are. And that alone is so fulfilling for any caregiver. As nurses, we can never stop learning. The medical field is constantly evolving. The world around us is constantly changing. As people, as human beings, the person before the nurse, there is no such thing as a mastery plateau in life. There are always deeper ways to grow, and there is always more to do. Nursing is versatile. I am a millennial, and we like to recreate the definitions of basically every word out there. <laughs> so if you shift the concept of what an entrepreneur is and allow it to adapt to your life, whether you are a business owner or you work for someone, being an entrepreneur means taking radical responsibility for your life and how you show up. If you can do that, you step into the art side of the nursing profession that is so challenging to show up as now. So bring back the art to the profession and get so creative in your care that your impact is nothing less than the most important healing experience for every person. Thank you.
I should have said stay up here, Christina, because we're gonna go to the question and answer. If all of our panelists would come up, please. I have Jess and Kirsten. I know they're out there. If you could go to the back and see Janine, she's gonna give you a wireless mic. Is Jess here? If not Jess, Gerald said he'd do it. He's my uh, pinch hitter tonight. There he is. Okay. Thank you. I need all of your business cards. As everyone was speaking, I'm like, I could, I have aging parents, I work in OB, I might be deposed someday. Morgan, some Botox areas, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> and of course, the art side of nursing. Yeah, that's such an awesome reminder. Um, so let's kick off some uh, questions out there. Just raise your hand. We've got two wireless mics. So wait till either Gerald or Kirsten gets to you before you ask so we can all hear you. I know it's always hard to ask the first question, but we've got one. I think it's Mackenzie. There she is. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, hello, this, my name is Mackenzie. Um, my question is for Susan. I was really interested in what kind of forensic cases you've done. Is that on? Hang on. Hang on. Chris will get it. There you go. Try again. Okay. Thanks. That's something I haven't done. No, I haven't gone into the criminal end of it. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of nurses that do it, but I don't. Um, when I worked in the ER, I had to um, take care of patients that were unfortunately perhaps, or they said they were raped, and they come in, and that's where that kind of nursing can come in as well. Um, it's called a SANE nurse. But I haven't, I haven't done it as an expert. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name's Brianna and I'm a senior. Um, this is just a question for Christina. Um, I was just wondering, do you have any advice for us on how to bring in um, like the art of nursing and like holistic care into the inpatient bedside, especially when we get so busy and swamped <laughs> with things to do. Yeah, I mean, I think it starts right here, right now, as students, just turning inward and identifying what your biggest strengths are and what, you're, what you love to do, because every nurse is gonna show up differently because we're all complex and dynamic people. So I think that starts now, and then to bring it into the bedside, never lose belief in a client, and powerful conversation can be had in five minutes. Um, examples of bringing in the art side, um, working oncology, we brought actual artists in to do like sip and paint minus the sip. Um, uh, but guided imagery, aromatherapy, um, hospitals are starting to integrate a little bit more modality of holism in, that can be really beneficial. We have one right down here, Riley. Hi, Hi my name is Riley, my question's for Christine. Uh, what are some ways that you help like your clients deal with their burnout? Like, what are some ways that you encourage them? Burnout is typically an umbrella that is rooted in so many different things. So imagine a weed in your lawn, and when you go down to its roots, you find that it shares in something else, in another weed, whether it's the same kind or something different. And then the roots go into something else. So burnout typically presents itself differently for everybody and it comes down to deeper roots. Uh, and that's a matter of sometimes changing your environment because let's be real, the nursing profession is hard right now. The environment is very challenging for us to do our work. Um, 
But if you have the burnout and you change your environment, the burnout's still likely to show up in other areas. So it's a matter of going internal and being really self-reflective and uh, getting really curious for yourself as to what's really bothering you, what's really going on, what's really your experience, and not rejecting it, but befriending it. I don't know if that's an answer. Let's get Sam down here. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm sorry, I'm really bad with names, so I don't really remember everybody's name. But um, for the nursing homes, can you talk a little bit about what you do to promote safe staffing in your facilities? Because I know it's a big issue in upstate rural New York, so what are you guys doing specifically? Topic, because, <laughs> yeah, as they put in the safe staffing uh, rule, you know, the rule is a 3.5 across the board. But what they didn't take into consideration is nursing homes and hospitals, they take care of all levels of care. So a 3.5 is an arbitrary number based on if you had a nursing home, if my nursing home was full of a, a more independent nature, I wouldn't require that many. But if I had a nursing home full of tube feed residents and residents who are total assist, I might need a 6.2 to adequately care for those residents. So I think that the state limited themselves in that, but I do think that it is important to nursing homes and probably my most exciting adventure that I'm on right now is getting enough staff into the nursing homes to want to care for the elderly and, and knowing what they can do. Like we just developed that hybrid CNA program and I want to, I'm just giving my idea out here to 200 people that I'm actually trying to work on, but get that program in to get the juniors and seniors in high school to start that career, even if they gave two hours a week to a nursing home, two hours a week to an elderly person is so important. So we have successfully in our facility, of the seven that we have in our facilities, we've been able to continuously grow that PPD but I don't think that that 3.5 was necessarily a, a safe standard because if I had a facility, and I do have a facility that has a very high acuity, I couldn't run and, and take care of my residents at a 3.5. I would have 27 pressure ulcers and, and weight loss. So I think it's really important that you, you know the level of care that you're taking care of and stay, as, Staff to that level so encouraging people to take that step and give a couple hours to a nurse aide and nursing you know a lot of people think that nursing homes are we fluff pillows and and play bingo which don't mess with their bingo because mm -hmm. that is a bad, bad thing but we are the ICUs now like when I started in nursing homes we were assisted living now we're skilled now we're hospitals so Great question, because it's the same in the hospitals, too. Hi, my, name my name is Caroline, and I have a question for Morgan. Um, I was just curious what got her interested in Botox and what the schooling like was like for that. Good question, Caroline. <laughs> um, I don't really know what got me interested in Botox. Um, I guess just that a lot of people, I don't know if maybe a lot of people have always gotten Botox and now we just know about it. Um, but a lot of my friends get Botox and I was like, oh, that would be fun to, to do on the side. And I thought six months ago I was bored and um, decided to take, I flew to Texas and took a two-day course and injected five patients with somebody that was, not somebody, people that were trained in it and then uh, came home and practiced on my family. <laughs> not Kathy, <laughs> but my own mom. Um, yeah, it's fun. I don't know. It's just something extra, and you make your own schedule, do it when you have free time, which is never right now, but it's quick, too. Quick money. Does 
Um, okay. Hi, my name is Dakota. I saw you did travel nursing for a little bit, so I just wanted to know what the process was to even be a travel nurse. Um, I did travel nursing like before it was a thing with COVID and you were making a ton of money. You still make more money with travel nursing, or you did then. Um, I don't know how many years of experience you need. I think I needed two years before I could travel. Um, and then you, there's a million agencies, and then as soon as you tell them you're interested, they'll never leave you alone. Um, <laughs> I still get text messages, I got one today, and I tell them every time I'm not interested. Um, but it's fun, it's a fun way to go do things. It's definitely different, and I would recommend having as much experience as you can before traveling because you get no training when you get there. Um, it's off to the races then, but it's fun. <laughs> if I can, I just want to add, since you said the two years, that was interesting. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, for a legal nurse, they really want you to work clinically full time five years and then you can look into legal nursing if you're interested, take classes, that kind of thing. In order to become board certified, you have to work 2,000 hours in the field before you can sit for the board exam, okay? But just wanted to let you know that you have to work as a nurse, yes, because they want you to have the, you know, your medical knowledge and your experience. Can everybody hear Jackson's question? He wants to know more the business end. How, how do you learn that? Because we don't teach that in nursing. So. Well, I'll answer for myself. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. You're not gonna, I, you could, I could not walk away from clinical nursing. It was 2007 to 2019. So I worked 12 years, two jobs. And I, I knew that I couldn't just get, once I got successful at it, yes. But the l other things that I mentioned about the ways that I grew my practice, it, it's, a, it's a, learn, a learning experience. It really is. And networking with other people who are going to want to do the same thing, okay? And, and putting yourself out there. But you can't give up, you know? You have to be, have courage and you have to keep moving forward if you want to do it. And I think that matters for anybody that's an entrepreneur. Yeah, I'll second that it doesn't happen overnight. It took me 13 months and from board certification and starting my business to quitting the bedside. Um, so definitely doesn't happen overnight. For me, networking is huge. Networking, the more you network, the more people you know, spreading the word out there, and really operating and running a business that is aligned to you and ensuring that your mission and vision is crystal clear, um, and just how you get there on the way doesn't have to be, but burnout in business is just as real as the bedside. Mm -hmm. You know, when you said business, uh, people do write a business plan, and what I did was I wrote goals. I wouldn't call it an actual business plan, but I knew that by this month, I needed to get my medical literature, my medical, um, um, legal newsletters out there. I needed to go see the attorneys. I needed to join the Bar Association. I needed to go to a conference. I gave myself deadlines, and that's, that's how I did it. Yeah. Um, mine is a little bit different, because technically I'm not, it's not my own business. I'm like a, I'm contracted through a company. Um, I did 
start like researching how to do it on my own, but I don't want to go injecting a paralytic into somebody, mm -hmm. not ever doing it before, and then just have my own business. <laughs> legally that wouldn't be great um so like this company trained me they provide malpractice insurance um i order my supplies through them because you also can't just order botox and needles to your house because that also looks sketchy um <laughs> mostly the needle part um so and then as a nurse practitioner i can't work independently i i think i need 3500 hours working as a nurse practitioner under a physician before I can work independently. So I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to be there. I'm not comfortable. So it's a little different. And for the coaching side, we haven't been around as long as the other specialties. Nurse coaching has only been a recognized specialty for about 12 years. So we are still in our infancy state. There's prof probably around 5,000 board certified nurses in the nation. So we're all still just trying to figure it out. I'm actually going to answer, even though it's nursing home, because you know the uh, the other advice I would give to people who want to start their own business is to research lawyers and um, law firms in your area that specialize in that area to help you build that LLC so you protect yourself against the lawyers. So it doesn't matter if you're starting any type of business. I mean, my husband owns a bar, you know. So if you want to own a business you got to go to the legal department that knows that specialty that you want to have your name on. Mm -hmm. So, And you mentioned, um, no, I think Morgan mentioned insurance. Yeah, I had to take out nursing. Even though, like when I work clinically, they will cover you, I had to take out my own private insurance for my business. So there's a lot involved, you know? Yeah, uh, you work really hard in these seats right now for a nursing license. And when you get into business, you do everything you can to protect that license. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to take it from there. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Carson. I'm a and senior. I'm a senior. Um, this is for all of the panelists. I was wondering what one piece of advice you would give for new grad nurses that you wish you had when you were coming out of school. Good question, Carson. Man, I would say stick with it. Like, I, w I wish that you truly can survive anything. RN school is hard, and you think it's the hardest because you're in it, but a lot of things in life are hard, and you can get through this. I wish somebody said really openly and honestly that you can do it. Like, obviously, everybody says that. People say that all the time. It's a, don't worry, you can get through this, but you really can. You know, look around this room. We've got a lot of people in here that are going to make it. Also, I started out on a med surge floor, I'd worked six years on a med surge floor. During the six years I was there, like people would only stay like 17 months or two years and we had a, a goodbye party and then we had, I, I went to so many goodbye parties in those six years. And finally when I left, I said the party is at my house and you're all coming. Because, you know, otherwise it was always a big travel to, to say goodbye to everybody. But anyway, what I'm saying is you might not start out in the, in the, in the field, yeah, in nursing, on the floor you want to work on, you know, for the rest of your life. It is normal to switch. It is normal to work two years in an area and then move on and move up. You know, and there's other opportunities, different shifts, maybe different positions. And you'll see as you go along that exactly where you fit in and what you like to do. Sinking. Um, I always used to tell people that I was an educator briefly um, in the medical ICU at Albany Med. And I used to tell the new grads that we would get in the ICU, you know, they'd be panicking because it's it is overwhelming. Um, but the ICU is not the only nursing job that you can have. Like there's you could literally do anything and you know, we, I had so many new grads that would be like, oh, you know, crying, it's too much. I always thought I wanted to do this. I'm like, well, you could go, go do anything and not, not be a nurse. Um, so, as you said, just you, it takes a minute to find where you belong mm -hmm. or where you feel comfortable. Right. Slow down. 
if you are in these seats already thinking about what the next step is after the first job, you are missing an incredible experience. Slow down and enjoy every movement in nursing and appreciate it for what it is. It doesn't have to be your landing spot forever, but slow down and find connection everywhere you are. Always did was laugh. I, I always felt the other nurses, and as hard as some days were and as sad as some days were, we still made time to, time to giggle and laugh and tell jokes. So make the best. Make the best of it. <laughs> Francesca. Hello. Um, I have a question for everyone. Um, how do you manage your continuing education or how managing your life and work balance? How does that, um, how do you manage? What's your best advice to give? throughout your career and raising a family or um, continuing your education? I lean on my mom a lot. I have yet to figure out the balance. I definitely seek alignment more. So um, high boundaries. When my work day is done. I turn off all my messaging apps so my clients can't contact me. Well, they can, but I don't see them. Um, so that I do my best to be with my family when it's family time. Boundaries. Boundaries are freedom. Um, as far as continuing ed, I stay up to speed in um, coaching, in the coaching industry right now. New York State, if you're out of state, every state has different requirements, but New York State doesn't require um, anything beyond an infection prevention, um, continuing ed for your license. So I just make sure that I do that on my own. Um, same, I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, thanks to Kathy and her husband and my parents, there's a good balance with having a child. Um, but 312s is great, working 312s. I mean, I didn't have a kid then, but I wish I still worked 312s. I don't know how anyone works five days a week, so I'm still trying to figure that out. It's been two years. Um, you mentioned something that I wanted to go off of. No, I don't know. That's it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mira. Mira, and this question I have is for Miss Susan. Um, but anyone is welcome to answer it as well. So I'm an international student. I'm right here. Um, I'm an international student, and I would like to ask you if you have ever worked with um, with a case that involved with like foreign nurses from another country, or what do you think about globalization of the nursing market? Because I feel like after COVID-19, a lot of foreign nurses came to America to um, work. And then um, I also would like to ask everyone, how do you guys feel about the globalization of like um, nurses coming in from different culture background, from different country? How do you guys adjust to that? What advice do you have to advocate for this, um, I would like? I would say international exchanging in like the working environment. So yeah. If you're asking me if I ever had a case that involved an international nurse, the answer is no. But I have many years of working with di people from dif different nationalities. Uh, many, many years ago, I worked on Long Island at North Shore University Hospital, and we had a really serious nursing shortage. And our administrators went over to Ireland and brought a whole slew of Irish nurses back to us to work on the floors. There was never a problem, never. I mean, we put them up, had housing, and they worked, and they fit right in. Um, I've never had an issue with it, to be honest with you. Question down down the middle here. Let 
This is like the best Q&A of the five years I've been doing O'Connor Chair. Thank you. Really. Hello. Okay. Uh, my name is Andrea. I'm a sophomore nursing student. And my question is, we join nursing for the purpose of helping others, but I think especially after seeing what happened with COVID, what are ways that we can get involved in policy change for the betterment of nursing and patients? Get to know your politicians, figure out lobbying. Um, there are organizations for nursing. We're lucky in New York State, we have branches for basically every main uh, organiza American organization. Start connecting. Find your people and start um, advocating. You, in my experience, in my opinion, the mainstream healthcare will put the walls up for you to advocate for such policy change. It's something you'll have to get involved with independently, likely, unless the university, I'm not sure if they do a lobbying day every year. Um, but lobby, find your New York State or whatever state you're from, your organization. Um, the New York State, AONL, and I think the ANA of New York has lobbying days coming up for a policy change. And encourage wherever you work to bring in that, uh, the government to, so you can talk to them. Like We are very strong at encouraging our county legislators, our assemblymen, and our state senators to come into the facilities to listen to the nursing staff, listen to all the staff, listen to the residents, the families, the administration, so that we can openly say those concerns that we have. Because if you don't say it, nothing's going to be done. I think you're coming in the profession at a very unique time where there's a lot of noise about nurses leaving the profession. And we are a large number. So just as much as we have the power to totally destroy the healthcare system, we have more power to rebuild it. And nurses are the only ones that can do that. We have one more question in the front. I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> I consider law school. I'm a death investigator as well, so I have some fun in that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I still don't know what I want to do. I think I found my niche. The, the, the thing I would do beyond this is do what we're doing right now is talking to nursing schools, talking to, actually, I would like to go to hospitals and meet with their risk management and teach nurses how to help, help them be careful and document properly. And, you know, if there was a mistake, you speak right up and things like that, you know. Um, that's what I would like to do to help nursing. No chance am I done. I, I seriously had a plan. I was going to retire when I was 50, and here I am, and there's so much more I want to do. I feel like that we lack a lot of education and competencies in nursing, especially in the skilled nursing area, so I'd like to grow that, and I would like to continue to grow the education because, to your point, in New York State, we're not even required to keep our CEUs. Anybody here want me to start their IV on them? I haven't done one in 20 years. <laughs> love to to grow on that so there's a lot to do and I'm with you I want to be a lawyer too I, wanna, I just like to argue uh, I I think I like I think I like what I do um, I don't like working five days a week but I like the um, patients I see and I do cardiology Monday through Friday that's my main job um, as a nurse practitioner and I do enjoy it a lot I don't think I would want to do anything else right now. But we, as a nurse practitioner, we have to have certain amount of education uh, credits. And my job, every month we have education for an hour and the physician is teaching us and it's a small group and they teach us uh, with every patient. So we're always learning new stuff and so it's not too much self-driven. Thank mm -hmm.
for Susan, I believe. You talked about documenting properly, and I know that our instructors, especially our clinical instructors, always tell us we should always be documenting, never document anything that you don't do um, for patient safety and for liability purposes. How many cases have you seen or have you seen any at all where you had to deal with nurses who didn't document properly or lied about documentation? I hate to admit it, but unfortunately, it's many, many. That is what happens. They either document or the wrong med or, you know, there's so many, uh, so many things that, you know, it's all liability that they're responsible for. The, mo the best advice I could give you is to document, honestly, you know, um, time it. If you, ta if you write a late note, you're going to late entry and put the time, okay? You can write in your note that at 2 p.m. this happened and it's a five o'clock note, but you want to be accurate when your documentation. You know, it's different today. Years ago, I did everything by hand. All our nurses' notes, right, were written. Now it's on the computer, so the computer knows what time it is, right? But so you're gonna have that time in anyway, and you can still write late entry, and then write your note. You can never, you can never get hurt if you're honest and you, and you write what you're supposed to write and the care that was given. That's a good question. It makes me think about clinical. Who has clinical tomorrow at 7? Yeah. So you need to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, the instructors as well. Um, so I want to thank our panelists one more time. They have busy lives, really busy lives. Most, all of them drove over an hour to be here with us tonight and to share and to uh, give us some insight and some inspiration, I hope. So thank you all so much. Okay, everyone get home safe, get to bed, and uh, hit the books. <laughs> <laughs>